Hello everyone and welcome to New Cancer Mentality. I'm David Farzam. Today we're extremely fortunate to be interviewing highly acclaimed researcher Dr. John McGowan. Dr. McGowan uses mathematics and mathematical software along with development of image and video processing algorithms to model cancer. He has come to an interesting conclusion about a model he feels should be adopted which could lead to much better treatment outcomes for cancer patients in the future. Dr. McGowan is a BS in physics from the California Institute of Technology and a PhD in physics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So thank you again for being with us today and sharing your knowledge to our audience, Dr. McGowan. Uh, Paul, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So first off, could you define what is cancer for our audience? Do you see it being one disease or many diseases? Um, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. I think it's a subtle and difficult question. Um, I tend to think of cancer at the higher level uh, that we have a, a system in our bodies which um, controls the devel division, the development, and the differentiation of cells. So it controls as we grow and live uh, what, what cells turn into, whether you have skin or whether you have nerves, muscles, and somehow directs the cells where they go. So it makes sure that the heart is where it's supposed to be and the lungs are where they're supposed to be and everything is sort of physically wired together correctly. You have to have nerves attached to muscles and blood vessels. There's this whole system uh, and it's quite miraculous that uh, all of this seems to work so well most of the time. And in cancer, it seems like something is going wrong with that system so that the cells are not properly developing into the cells they're supposed to be. And uh, even worse, uh, well, they're growing also when they're not supposed to. But I think even worse, they seem to move to places they're not supposed to be, which is what kills an awful lot of cancer patients. So some kind of poorly developed skin uh, cell actually migrates to the lungs and, and eventually grows and kills the patient. And so my sense of it is I tend to look at more systema systemically or at a higher level. However, it's a little bit, I think, like a car, or thinking about what a car is. When we look at cars, we see cars. We see something with four wheels, it moves around, it has certain characteristics, we call it a car. But if you look at the part level, the spark plugs, the wheels, who made the car, you have Ford, you have Toyota, they vary all over the place, and yet we always call certain things a car. And people have traditionally identified certain diseases and certain problems as cancer. And pathologists seem to be able to look under a tissue under a microscope and say, I'm pretty sure that's cancer, just like we can identify a car by looking at it. And yet, when we've looked at these um, cells at a molecular level and also at a chromosomal level, which is partly what I'm going to talk about, there are enormous variations. So there are hundreds, perhaps even thousands, we don't know yet, of these uh, cancer genes and tumor suppressor genes and the many different sets of them seem to be mutated in what the sort of at this higher level we think of as skin cancer or breast cancer and that's kind of mysterious. Um, the g individual genes have been the focus of a lot of the research over the last 30 years. Uh, if you look at the chromosomal abnormalities which are often too many chromosomes and all kinds of other chromosomal changes that occur in cancer, you also find these are very varied. Um, it's extremely common, perhaps ubiquitous, that there are too many chromosomes in a cancer cell, but there's a lot of variation. Different ones are duplicated, they're reorganized, their pieces are deleted. Uh, I believe sometimes parts of one chromosome are combined with another chromosome, and they seem to vary a lot in what we again see as the same kind of cancer, or skin cancer or breast cancer or something like that. Um, so it's kind of mysterious what this relationship among these different levels is and why we see so much variation at this sort of building block level in what we call cancer. What got you interested into going into cancer research and studying cancer? Um, well, that's, that's kind of a long story, but I think I'll tell it. I hope people will bear with me. Um, I worked for several years at NASA Ames Research Center uh, where I mostly did uh, work on image and video compression technologies. Uh, so those are the kind of technologies that are in DVD discs or Blu-ray or that are used to allow us to stream the video for this, um, for this conference. Um, as part of that, I got involved in designing a video system for an airplane, a proposed airplane that was going to fly on Mars down what's called the Valles Marineris Canyon and basically broadcast a video of this mission. Um, now, that 
the reason that's related to life is kind of involved, but basically it's theorized that the Valles Maris Canaris Canyon, which is about 2,000 miles long, uh, was formed by water, by flowing water. And, you know, there's a lot of interest in water on Mars because maybe if there was water, there was life. And that got me kind of interested in questions about life and life on Mars and the origin and evolution of life. So I looked into the origin and evolution of life. And I'll talk a little bit about the origin of life stuff, but it doesn't have that too much to do with cancer. It's ideas about how evolution might work that relate to cancer, and I'll talk more about those. So one of the things that's come out of molecular biology is that at the molecular level, at the level of the proteins and the DNA, um, biological systems, living things, are very complicated. They're made of many parts, and these parts seem to have to work together you know, very precisely, kind of like a grandfather clock or like a lock and a key. So the different proteins have matching shapes, matching chemical affinities, and they implement very complicated systems. Um, I think that's a little bit of a surprise at how complex it's proven to be. And this presents problems. It prevents actually severe problems for the origin of life, and it raises some questions about uh, how evolution might have worked. So in the case of the origin of life, the big problem is that the simplest living things that we actually know about are certain bacteria, and they're still very complicated. They have, I think, hundreds of different genes and components in even the simplest living things that we know about. Now, viruses are simpler, but they're not alive in the same sense. They piggyback off other living things, which they sort of con into replicating the virus. So you can argue they're not truly alive, and a virus could not have been the first living thing. So you have this kind of problem that the simplest living things we can come up with and we actually see and also that you can sort of think about are these complicated machines, kind of like a grandfather clock. Now, there's a general idea in biology that maybe the first living thing was a self-replicating RNA molecule. RNA has potential to carry genetic information. It does carry genetic information. And it also has some enzymatic action. So I think the leading theory, which still has a lot of problems, is that maybe the first living thing was somehow a piece of RNA was produced you know, billions of years ago, which replicated itself and eventually evolved into the life we know. Uh, but that's, that's very iffy, and I, I think it's really a great puzzle. So I started thinking about the question, is there a way that some chemical or physical process on the early Earth or maybe in deep space uh, maybe in carbonaceous chondrites, which have a lot of organic material in them, uh, could have produced a system of interacting molecules which was essentially alive and able to evolve. So not one uh, molecule, but somehow a system. That seems, at first glance, how could that happen? It seems impossible. And the way that people normally think about this is that each of these pieces is produced by some random process in this hypothetical primordial soup. So you've got dozens of different molecules produced separately, independently. So for them to, out of the blue, produce a, a cell or a living system, um, the odds of that happening appear to be sort of cosmological. It's beyond astronomical. It, it, you know, the calculations will often show, you know, you couldn't do it in the lifetime of the universe we know. Uh, so it seems very unlikely that's what happened. Um, however, there's a different way of thinking about it that might make the odds of this happening um, higher. And so the basic idea is think about how we make a jigsaw puzzle. A jigsaw puzzle is made out of hundreds or thousands of tightly coupled parts. They all have matching shapes. And how do we achieve that? We don't do it by manufacturing each part separately and they fortunately fit together. Um, the way you make a jigsaw puzzle is you take a piece of cardboard or a wood and you cut it up in a lot of little pieces and they automatically fit together because they came from the single original piece. Um, so what would be the chemical equivalent of that? How could that happen in chemistry on the early Earth? And what you could envision happening is you have this big macromolecule, a polymer, maybe something like RNA or proteins. Uh, could be a lot of things at first. And it's this big blob. It's just floating around. It's all packed together, but it has no real structure to it. It comes in contact with something. It could be as simple as water, maybe an acid, something like that in the early Earth environment. And it gets shattered into a lot of pieces, cut up in pieces those pieces are tightly matched together so that each piece can act as a template for the formation of part of its neighboring piece. Um, so you can envision a process whereby every once in a while, this would still be very rare, um, the likelihood of this happening would be low, but it wouldn't be these cosmological odds. 
And so you could have this one event that produces a simple, it might not be that simple, it could actually have hundreds of pieces, but a simple living, crude living organism, maybe even with a primitive genetic code. And so I thought that's an, that's an interesting idea, and I wrote that up. Um, and that really doesn't have too much to do with cancer, but that's sort of where I got into this. Um, what has more to do with cancer is I was thinking about the question of how do these complicated systems that we see, um, you know, these tightly coupled genetic or tightly coupled protein systems, how could they have appeared or how could they be evolving in such a way that they maintain this tight coupling between the parts? Um, so the analogy that has been used I'm, is that of a lock and key. So you have one protein, it somehow fits into the other protein precisely and they interact and do the right thing. And if there's a small error, so in one of the proteins the system will fail, and that's frequently fatal. So you have things like cystic fibrosis or hemophilia or a variety of these other diseases in which a protein is either missing or it's simply been damaged. It doesn't have the right shape, it doesn't handshake with its partner correctly, and bang, the, the person will die. And this raises a lot of questions about both where did these things come from, and they're quite common from most accounts, and how did they evolve? If they need to adapt to the environment around them, how could they ever change? Because once you have this tight coupling of the elements, if you, if you only mutate one gene, it will almost always break this handshaking process. The key will not fit in the lock, or the lock will no longer accept the key, and the thing fails. So is there any way you might get around that? Now, mainstream biology has usually explained this through sort of scaffolding mechanisms. I think it's called Muller's Arch. There are these kind of complicated scenarios where you can sort of get around this problem. Uh, but they seem improbable. They seem like a stretch to me. And you have to consider, we don't just see these tightly coupled systems once in a while. They're all over the place. You know, the whole system is working like this. So what I wanted to do is try to explain those ideas because of how this might work. Because they led me to look at the chromosomal abnormalities in cancer, the numerical abnormalities. Um, now what I'm going to talk about during most of our interview is a way that you might target the abnormal number of chromosomes to treat or cure cancer. And that doesn't depend on a particular theory of how the genetic system works or the nature of cancer. There are quite a number of different ideas about the genetic system and ideas about how cancer works, where it would work. Um, there are also ideas about the, uh, the way cancer works where it would not work, where it's sort of an unimportant side effect that you have this abnormal number of chromosomes and it's not going to to cure the disease or, or even treat it effectively. But there's quite a number of, of scenarios under which it would be effective or partially effective. It would be a treatment and not a cure. Um, but I do want to discuss these genetic things a little bit. So I'm going to use some pictures. Let me just explain that these ideas, in the way I have often presented them, they're pretty mathematical. They come out of computer science. And they're pretty abstract. They're hard to follow. So I'm going to show some pictures to try to illustrate what I'm talking about. And this is a pretty simplified, just to kind of give you a, and the audience a sense of, of what I'm talking about. If there's some truth to this, the system that's in our bodies, if there is such a thing, is probably more complex and difficult to understand. So I've intentionally simplified the concepts just to get the basic idea across. So let me go ahead and I'll start with this. Can you see this OK? We have a picture here. Is it coming through all right? Yes. OK. So what I'm showing here, the, the thing on the bottom is a DNA strand. And the lowercase letters, we have A, B, C. Um, these are actually kind of placeholders. These are not the coding DNA that we think about. Uh, they would be more like the binding sites for the regulatory proteins. So they don't actually encode the proteins directly. Um, they will function something like a block diagram in engineering. In engineering, you have a block diagram, say, of a car. It has a block for an engine. It has a block for the steering column. It has a block for the wheels. Uh, it doesn't define the individual parts, but allows the engineer to design and modify the system at a higher level. And so, so these elements here, these um, placeholders, would be functioning essentially like that in the genetic system. So, so we're imagining here that in addition to the coding DNA that we know about, there's something else hiding, let's say, in the so-called junk DNA that does some other things. So. Up here, we have some magic things that are kind of modeled on mobile genetic elements. I don't know if they are the mobile genetic elements that we know about, but they would work in a somewhat similar way. And they carry payloads of actually the coding DNA in this simple example. 
So this example is actually showing a representation of two genes that handshake together, so like the lock and the key. And we envision these genes as built of pieces. So A, the capital letter A, represents kind of the body of one of these genes. Maybe it's a digestive enzyme or something like that. It's not involved in the interface or interaction with the other gene. And then this guy in the center, which, which interacts with and replaces the, the lowercase b target, this is actually the handshaking. So b plus would be like the key, and b minus would be like the lock that it goes into and turns. And the t represents a terminator, so it represents the end of a gene. And then c is the body of a second gene. So in these types of schemes, we have a mechanism sort of hidden from our view in which the system as a whole is encoded and we're able and so the two seemingly separate genes that handshake together are jointly encoded so the interface is hidden uh, the specification of the interface is hidden from our view um, so let me show you what would happen in this very simple case these sort of magic things which may be similar to the mobile genetic elements that people have observed um, these will now replace the placeholders in this simple way of looking, a simple example, and they now create the coding DNA that we are uh, used to. So we have two genes now, the A, the B+, plus. and again the B+, plus is like the key, and the T is the end of the first gene, and then the B- minus is functioning like the lock that the key is inserted into, and then we have C, which is kind of the functional part of the gene, maybe like the mechanism of the lock, which is not acting as an interface. It just maybe opens the door or something like that. So the system has created a pair of genes that interact with one another um, and are tightly coupled together. So that's the basic low level of it. Um, are there any questions? Is there anything I should clarify? So basically the two genes and then it's like a lock and a key and then what, what takes place after that? The mechanism in part C will will work to fix whatever is in disarray? Well, it's, it's a way of generating um, a, a network of interacting of genes which code for a network of interacting proteins. And it ensures that they all work together correctly because they always have these matching interface components. And what I'll show you is how you can sort of rearrange things and you preserve this lock and key relationship. So here is a more complicated one. So this will actually represent uh, a chain or cascade of three, um, three genes when it's done. But again, what we have here is we have the DNA. We have these placeholders, A, B, C, D, and E. And these placeholders, again, they're not the coding DNA. They would be uh, like regulatory, like the binding sites for regulatory proteins. So they're a kind of non-coding DNA. In this example, we have two interfaces. So B is the interface between what will turn out to be the first gene and the second gene. And then D is the interface between the second gene and the third gene. So this might like be like a cascade, a sequence of genes. Gene 1 activates gene 2. Gene 2 activates gene 3. So if we go, and let's see, can, let me see if I got that right. OK. So after we do this kind of substitution process, we have a sequence of three genes. So the first gene is formed from components from the first two. So you have A, the B plus is functioning like a key. So that's one half of the handshake. And the T is the terminator, so it splits it. And then the B minus is like the lock. That's been given to the other gene that it handshakes with. And then you have C. And then this is a sequence of genes. So we now have a new, a new key on the other end of this gene, the D plus, and a terminator to end the encoding of the gene. So this middle gene is actually talking to two neighboring genes, or the protein that it makes will actually handshake in a sequence um, with these other proteins. And then the final gene in this fairly simple example has a D minus, that's the lock, what it talks to, and an E. So what this would be encoding for is the first gene activates the second gene, the second gene activates the third, or more correctly, the protein synthesized by the first gene, the protein synthesized by the first gene will interact with the protein from the second gene, 
which will then activate the protein from the third gene. So you get a simple network. Now, in now, now what does that buy you in terms of evolution and some other things? Um, here I, I show a simple example of rewiring this block diagram. So this is the higher level description that might be hidden somewhere in the junk DNA. Um, so we have C, B, A, uh, D, and E. So I flipped A and C. That would be like a mutation. Now again, these lowercase italics letters represent the placeholders. The placeholders are like um, the binding sites for regulatory proteins and these sort of quasi-mobile genetic elements will attach to them and insert actual coding DNA where they are and build the genetic networks that we see. So if you f swap them like that and now we have actually built the coding DNA or put it in place then we have a sequence of three genes and we've gone from one network that worked to a new network which is sort of re-spliced together um, that works. Let me see if I can get that position correctly. So we have C, B plus and the terminator is the first gene. This is different from the gene in the first network. Um, it now has the interface from a previous from another gene swapped in with it. That the protein from that will then activate the protein from the second gene which again has been changed and then that protein from that will activate the third. So this process of these quote mutations unquote in this block level diagram in the placeholders will manufacture another network, another grandfather clock that has tightly coupled interacting parts. Now these could be like sequences within the control networks that may be malfunctioning in cancer, some of the cascades of proteins uh, that are described that control this process. Um, so that's that's fairly low level, but it can function at many, many different levels uh, in the system. So let me try to show that. Before, before I go further, do you have any questions? Anything I should clarify? I think as of now, I, I get it pretty well, but please continue. Okay. 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 Now, engineers create block diagrams at many different levels. So you might have a very high level diagram like I described where you have a block for an engine and a block for a you know the wheel train and that, that kind of thing. And then as you get down, as you refine that you would take the block diagram from the engine and turn it into the parts of the engine. Again it's still a block diagram. It might be like these are the cylinders, this is the carburetor, but you haven't really got down to your part level, to the screws and bolts. So here we have, we're trying to show this concept of many levels. So again we have the DNA strand here. We have these lowercase letters which represent the um, placeholders and the placeholders are probably uh, sequences of DNA that don't code for proteins they will work something like these binding sites for the regulatory proteins. Um, in their case, something like the mobile genetic elements is attaching to them and inserting other DNA in place of them or possibly next to them. This is a very simple example, so I don't show inserting next to them. I just say, let's replace it. Let's keep it simple to illustrate the concept. So here, the G, which is a placeholder for a subsystem, is going to be replaced by placeholders for sort of sub-subsystems, I and J. So this is I here. I actually represents an interface and it in turn will be replaced by coding DNA which is shown with this element here. So we have I minus which is the, the lock and T is the terminator that ends the gene and I plus is the, um, the key. So the first phase of this, what will happen, is the replacement of the placeholders. We don't get to the coding DNA yet. Um, okay, so we've replaced, we now have F, I, J, and K, not K, H. And so again, these, in this diagram at this point, this is the DNA strand. These are sequences of DNA that are not coding, they don't produce proteins, uh, but they're functioning kind of like the binding sites for the regulatory proteins. 
except something different from the normal regulation occurs. Instead, this sort of mobile genetic element-like thing, or maybe it is the mobile genetic elements that people have observed, will come in and insert, in this case, it will insert coding DNA to replace the I placeholder. So that represents an interface. So it has I plus, which is the key, one half of the handshake between two proteins. It has the T, or terminator, for ending the gene. And it has the I minus, which is like the lock that the key fits into, the other half, the other hand in the handshake. So when we complete that process, we end up with F, the I plus, etc. We actually have coding DNA here now, finally. What do the other placeholders represent? They represent subsystems. They could be ultimately just one other part of the gene, like in the first examples I showed, or they could be complex systems of genes. They could be hundreds of genes. So you can envision this as representing large-scale components of the genetic system of the body, things like the complex systems of proteins that control the cell cycle. So this whole thing could be a small part of this mysterious network which controls cell differentiation and which we think is breaking in cancer. So the, the advantage of having something like this is that as you make these changes, you can get system level mutations, you can swap modules around, rearrange stuff at many different levels. So you can have changes that maybe two genes get rearranged and they still handshake correctly, but they're now not the same genes. You can have whole modules duplicated or swapped and you get a whole system which will at least fit together like a grandfather clock. Now, probably many times it doesn't work really right and it dies, but you don't get this constant situation where you get things like cystic fibrosis or hemophilia. All the individual parts are rigged to handshake correctly in these mutations or changes that occur in the system. Um, so this would greatly accelerate and enhance the evolutionary process um, and it would allow, through swapping various pieces together, to build, um, you know, these things that are many interacting parts, you know, this, uh, that are like clocks or other things where several parts have to work together together uh, in order for the thing to work uh, right. Now, what does that have to do with cancer? Well, this is a, this is, um, This would imply that you ought to see processes in biology where you see large-scale reorganizations of the genetic system. So you might see whole pieces of chromosomes moving around. You might see chromosomes duplicated or swapping material. These would be higher level dynamic changes that you would see. In addition to what we tend to think of mutations in evolution as involving, you know, one gene gets damaged or modified, but you would see large-scale structural changes. And in fact, that's what's reported over and over again in cancer, in that you don't just have individual genes, you have all kinds of these chromosomal changes. Frequently you have too many chromosomes, but you get all kinds of restructuring. Chromosomes get spliced together, pieces get removed, all kinds of changes occur. These changes don't kill the cancer cells. The cancer cells keep chugging along, so it's like you took your grandfather clock and you jumbled it up, you pu pulled pieces out, and somehow magically it came back together and it works fine. In fact, you could argue in cancer that it is working better because it is this dynamic you know, cell and it starts eating the body and killing the body. From the standpoint of us as people, that's bad, but the cell has not only, it hasn't been impaired in its functioning uh, through this happening. So cancer is an example of something that looks kind of like what you might expect from a system like this. Um, it's also the case that the, I believe, that these kind of changes are often reported in the immortal uh, cell lines, not just the ones which are derived from cancer, or like the Henrietta Lacks or HeLa cells, but there are also some which are supposedly derived from normal cells, but they also develop these kind of strange genetic instabilities which don't necessarily seem to kill a cell, it just seems to keep chugging right along. Um, so that, that's the basic explanation. Um, when I came up with this concept, I derived it from ideas in computer science and mathematics, and I wasn't that familiar with the history of ideas in biology. 
and when I did further research I found that this is fairly similar to some ideas that go back to the 50s and 60s and that are associated with Barbara McClintock and she used the language of what she called controlling elements from her research in maze and those controlling elements sound a lot like the placeholders that I showed you. Um, so she envisioned not only that the genes were jumping around, uh, which she had inferred from studying you know, the evolution of maize, but that there was a system, that this was sort of intelligent the way this was happening. Now, in the 1970s when molecular biology really took off, it, people were able to confirm that the genes were jumping around and that there were these mobile genetic elements. However, her ideas about this sort of intelligent system, these controlling elements, this was not just random, there was something intelligent happening, uh, those were never accepted by the general biology community, although I think she continued to believe it until she passed away. Um, but So anyway, these ideas are more mathematical, but they parallel ideas that have been at least proposed in biology in the past. So, so those are the ideas that led me to look at these chromosomal abnormalities in cancer. As I said at the beginning, what I'm going to discuss does not depend on this kind of unorthodox genetic theory to work. If aneuploidy causes cancer through a brute force mechanism, you've just duplicated a lot of genes and that's sort of overloading the control network, um, what I'm going to talk about would work. If aneuploidy is sort of a predictable, guaranteed consequence of cancer or certain cancers, it's a marker for cancer. Even though it doesn't cause it, we can target it to destroy cancer. Uh, it's also the case of all that aneuploidy is doing is it's causing rapid evolution of the cells. It makes them sort of unstable, so they mutate rapidly, they evolve rapidly, and they develop immunity to drugs like chemotherapy agents. Then we can use what I'm going to talk about. It won't cure cancer by itself, but if we can kill the cancer cells that are evolving rapidly, we're left with cancer cells that don't evolve rapidly, that we may be able to kill with the traditional drugs or other treatments. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is not dependent on a particular theory of the genetic system, and it's not dependent on a particular theory of cancer, although it does depend on certain relationships. If, if aneuploidy, which is the abnormal number of chromosomes, has certain relationships to cancer, we can use this to cure it or treat it. There are other relationships under which it would not be effective. So that's the way to think about it. Continuing on, wh why, do you, why do you think that the mainstream methodology of treating cancer and that they look for one difference between one gene per se, between a cancerous cell and a normal cell, why do you think we really haven't made much progress using this methodology since we declared the war on cancer about 40 years ago? Well, I, I'll give a couple, couple of answers to that. Um, I'll give a sort of big picture answer and a little picture answer. And the big picture answer is that it's not uncommon in the history of technology or science to find these periods when there's very little progress and very often that has meant that some assumption or group of assumptions about whatever you're doing is incomplete or just wrong. And so the fact that there's been such poor progress after it's now about 40 years since the war on cancer was declared, you know, should raise in people's mind the question of whether some assumption or part of the approach, something that perhaps everybody is thinking, um, is not right. Um, if you look at, at historical breakthroughs, it's not uncommon to find something that everybody was doing that seemed very reasonable, well supported by the evidence, sensible, that turned out not to be correct. So I think given the lack of progress at this higher level, people should be thinking about that question. Maybe something is just not what we think. Um, so that that's the big picture answer. Um, I think if we accept the prevailing view about what cancer is, which is these mutated genes, we have found that there are many different kinds of cancer at this genetic level. We have you know, dozens of genes that have to mutate and it's many different combinations of these genes which cause many different kinds of cancers, although at a high level it looks like the same disease to us. Um, that makes it very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult to knock out the cancer 
uh, through looking at those genes or the individual proteins that mm, those genes generate, because at best uh, we might kill one tiny slice of cancer, you know, 0.1%, this particular type of skin cancer. Um, I think that's where the hope is right now when you read about personalized medicine and cancer treatment. That's where people are going. Uh, but it's a long slog because it means you have to develop thousands of treatments for cancer. And it's combined with the problem that it's believed that the cancers are mutating, they're evolving immunity. So even if you develop a drug that targets a particular protein like Gleevec or Herceptin, you're up against that the cancer cells may develop immunity to that drug. So in the orthodox theory, and which is, tends to focus on a, on a protein or a drug which targets a particular protein, you know, that, that's very, very difficult. Um, so what I'm talking about today is more about a system level approach where we try to find some way, maybe through a mathematical or logical calculation we can do in the cell to say, well, this is a cancer cell and kill the cancer cell, but we're not using an individual protein. We're trying to look for some feature um, that is characteristic of cancer. Traditionally, that's what chemotherapy has tried to do by focusing on the fact that the cells divide, but that's had severe problems because you know, healthy cells, normal cells, also divide and they get killed by the chemotherapy. So it's proven at best you know, marginal benefits for huge cost. So we need something more intelligent than chemotherapy to somehow say, okay, this guy is growing too fast, kill it. This other one is a st healthy stem cell, and although it's growing fast, we don't want to kill that one. And that's, you know, beyond what we have, and I don't think that's really, that may be changing, but that's really not been the approach. The approach has been target a protein from an oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene and try to knock it out. And that's, you know, maybe that will lead us there, but it's, it's up against this huge number of genes and proteins that have been identified. Great. So on that note, could you describe for our audience the algorithm, the bathtub mechanism that you've been working on in detail? Mainly, why do you believe it's important to target cancerous cells with an abnormal number of chromosomes, and how do you plan on targeting these cells specifically? Okay, I'll answer that question. So, uh, let me explain in reverse order why you might look at the chromosomes. Uh, I gave this big long discussion of this genetic theory, but what, I talk, what I'm talking about does not depend on that. Um, we have found that there are enormous and very variable variations in the oncogenes in cancer. Something else that's been known for a century is that you very frequently observe the wrong number of chromosomes in cancer cells. And that has at times been postulated to cause cancer. That's not the prevailing view today. But it's highly correlated with cancer for sure, and that's agreed upon. And there hasn't been, I suspect, enough research into the relationship of this abnormal number of chromosomes to cancer to be sure you know, what that relationship is and how we could exploit that. But because it's there in many different kinds of cancers, breast cancer, skin cancer, it's sort of a glo it may be, it may function as a global feature or a trait of cancer cells that we could go after. Now why haven't people gone after it? There's not been you know, a way. How do you count the number of chromosomes in a cell and kill it? Well, you can envision nanotechnology a hundred years from now. We have these tiny little robots. They go into the cells. They go around and they somehow count the chromosomes and they say, okay, there's the wrong number of chromosomes. A healthy cell has 46 chromosomes usually, and a cancer cell will often have 60 or 90 or something like that. So this super smart robot kills the cell. Well, that's great, and we may be able to do that 50 years from now or 100 years from now, but it's nowhere near the technology we have today, and we probably won't have it for a long time. So is there something simpler we can do? Is there some way we can perform maybe a simple mathematical or logical operation in the cell and say, okay, this cell has too many chromosomes, knock it out, kill it? And the bathtub mechanism is a possible approach to do that. That does not require a robot, does not require something with hundreds or thousands of moving parts. It would be complex by the standards of modern genetic engineering. Most modern genetic engineering we're going after, you know, one protein. Uh, we were able to treat cystic fibrosis, at, it was a Herculean effort, but they were able to find out what the protein was that was wrong. I think they went up on the space shuttle to figure out the shape of that protein. It was not easy to come up with a drug that treats cystic fibrosis. 
but it's one protein. What I'm going to talk about is a system of proteins or molecular building blocks, maybe five, maybe ten. A lot simpler than that robot, but I'm not claiming it wouldn't be difficult with our current technology. Uh, it would go beyond what we've done, which is mostly single protein engineering, to a system of proteins or a system, of, it could include RNA, it could include other things, but a system of building blocks which would function to perform a simple calculation to say there are too many chromosomes or too few and kill the cell. So how, how spe more specifically would you do that? Well, I present and call it a bathtub mechanism by making an analogy to how a bathtub functions. You have a faucet and a normal bathtub or a couple faucets and you have a drain. And the bathtub is designed when it's normal that even if you turn on the faucets all the way, the water will not overflow the bathtub unless you plug the, the drain. So if the drain is open and you've got all the water you can pouring into it, the water level is not going to rise. Um, you know, you would flood your apartment if you didn't have it designed that way. Uh, imagine you add more faucets to the bathtub. At some point you're going to be putting too much water in for the drain to remove and the water level will rise and it will rise until it overflows the bathtub. So the analogy to that in a cell is while well, the bathtub is kind of the cell membrane, the interior of the cell. We can envision engineering a sort of a faucet, and I'll explain a little bit more about how you would do that, uh, that is basically a numerical feature associated with the chromosomes. Um, in my article, I, you know, I use the telomeres because that's something I'm familiar with, but there may be other features of the chromosome or the chromosome system that are better suited for this purpose. That's intended to illustrate one way we might be able to do it. I would hope that, you know, biologists more familiar with the chromosomal system would look at it and say, well, you know, this is the thing that would be most likely to be used safely and, you know, we already know how to do things with it. Uh, but for illustrative purposes, I use the ends of the telomeres as the faucets. So a normal healthy cell has 46 chromosomes and so we envision something that's sort of adding a poison to the cell at the telomeres in proportion to the number of telomeres. So we need a drain. Now ideally the drain would be something in the cell that's already there and it needs to be something which is the same size, the same number in a normal healthy cell and in the cancer cells. Now that's a potential gotcha because the cancer cells are believed to be mutating all the time and evolving. So even if you identify a feature you could use as your drain, maybe it disappears or is changed in some way in the cancer cell. So I envision a mechanism by which you can add one drain and one drain only using a kind of modified bacteriophage. And maybe I'll come back to that, but in other words, the, the drain in my sort of starting approach is artificially added in such a way that you get one drain in every cell, the cancer cells and the normal healthy cells. So we have a drain which has a maximum throughput and what it does is the poison is destroyed at the drain. It becomes non-toxic at the drain. And there's a maximum rate at which the drain can remove the poison from the cell. Now the poison is being added through a harmless precursor that in this, this sort of simple first pass interacts with the end of the telomere, breaks apart and becomes toxic in the normal healthy cells with 46 chromosomes, um, they're being added at a certain rate which the drain can absorb and neutralize. So the concentration of the poison doesn't rise enough to kill or significantly harm the cell in a normal healthy cell. Again, that's because we have only 46 kind of faucets and we have this one big drain and it can remove the poison fast enough. Now in the cancer cells you often have 60 to 90 chromosomes. You have many more, you have many more ends of the chromosomes, so you get a faster rate of addition of the poison. And the system would have to be engineered to add the poison more rapidly than the drain can remove it. Then the poison level will build up in the cell to a lethal level and kill that cell. And that is the basic notion. Now, this is nowhere near the complexity of nanotechnology robots but I also want to say it would be technically challenging to do with our current level of technology. I also want to say I've omitted some technical difficulties and details that I am aware of just to present the basic concept of how you would do this. Um, it would not be easy, but it has some virtues. One of those virtues is these chromosomal abnormalities are found in a wide range of cancers, so you're not targeting 0.1% of the cancers we know about. You might be targeting 99% of them, all the solid tumors or a large subset. Um, it's very general, so for example, you might be able to test it out and verify it reliably in animals without using people as guinea pigs, but
but really test it, which has often been a problem with developing some of these drugs because the chromosomal abnormalities will also be present in, you know, animals. Of course, it's unfortunate to sacrifice the animals, but I think for such a, you know, serious disease, people will probably think that's okay. Wait. So, how would how would you go about developing this concept then and evaluating the technical feasibility of the concept? Well, that's a good question. I, I think in my mind there's two kind of overlapping things. You really need specialists in a lot of areas in biology to look at it. Um, you know, both to poke holes in it, it may not be possible. My guess is there probably is a way to get it to work. But you need people who really know the details of how the chromosomes work, the different constituents of the cell, to look at it and say, well, where have we got something we know about that could function as the faucets, is what I call the sources, as the drain? How would you get this working? That's conceptual. I mean, people can look at it and go through what we know, what they know, and contribute their comments or say, that's a terrible idea, that would never work, you can't use the end of the telomere because it's involved in this other process and you'll kill the cell. That's certainly a concern. Um, so there's that part which is strictly conceptual um, and which really requires the expertise of a lot of different specialists in biology because we could use, who knows, many different things. Um, a lot of that would be people familiar with the, the, the chromosomal system and the cell cycle to really understand how to do it. So that's one part. I think the other part is this is you're tuning these reactions to get just the right rates so that the drain will remove the poison in the normal healthy cell with 46 chromosomes and it will kill the cells that have too many chromosomes. And to really make it work and to achieve success, I think you would want to construct a sort of mathematical model simulation of what's happening in the cell. Um, I know there are some things like this that might already exist that you could use to sort of model what would happen. But I think it would be important and it would speed up the process to model this process in action and see if it makes sense. Uh, that gets into some technical questions like whether or not diffusion is a proper model for molecular transport inside the cells or something else is going on. So there's a number of these types of both mathematical and physics issues that I think would arise. But that's all stuff that could be done on a relatively small budget, a few people, although it might involve a large number of people contributing some pieces of what happens, they wouldn't have to do it full time. They might just look at it and say, well, you know, from my expertise in this particular part of the cell, that wouldn't work, or you could do it this way, or those kind of issues. So this would be what I would call conceptual design, where you try to build a detailed, very specific model or models of how you might do this. It might turn out after you do that, okay, this is not, you know, the great idea I, like, I think it is. Uh, it's more likely you would come up with some ways that you might do it as well as you know specific experiments that would be your next step to say to confirm can we start to build the pieces of this. Um, it's hard to know. I would definitely propose to go through a conceptual design process and a simulation to see you know does this make any sense to go further because unless you sort of luck out and you find, oh, all the pieces we need have already been worked out and we just plug them together, and the odds are against that. Um, you know, it would be a very substantial undertaking with our current technology. It would be, um, you know, it wouldn't be the Apollo program, but it would be a substantial undertaking, and there's no point in undertaking it if you don't have some solid reason to think you could get it to work. Um. Why, why is the conceptual design phase and technical feasibility assessment a good idea? I think you just touched on that, but could you describe it a little I, bit I basically further? covered that. I, I, I wanted to cover the point that the, the actual implementation, uh, you're looking at anywhere from probably tens of millions of dollars on the low end to hundreds of millions on the high end. So this is a large investment of people's time and effort, and there's no good reason to do it without first going through much more detailed analysis of the concept. Um, this is what NASA does with their projects. A typical NASA project is anywhere from a, you know, hundred million to a billion dollars. So when you're talking about that amount of money, you want to go through this detailed design process and think about what you're doing in a lot of detail to decide is it worth spending the taxpayer's money or investor's money on this bigger scale project. So what what do you think is uh, the best method we should use to 
to further bring about this collaborative environment that you're proposing that you'll need to test this idea? Do you think using uh, this video chat conferencing method we're using now could possibly help? Um, I think it might help people communicate, which I think is important at a sort of a personal level as well as covering, um, I'm trying to cover the higher level uh, concept. Um, I tend to think something more like, um, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but more like something like Wikipedia or something where different people can contribute different, you know, I'm an expert in telomeres. Well, there'd be sort of like a Wikipedia page, but maybe a little bit different, that talks about, okay, what would we do if we use the telomeres as our faucets, as our sources? And then the people that have expertise and knowledge or simply research that, could contribute their pieces and you could keep track of who contributed what and all that kind of stuff. So I think in principle we could exploit uh, things like wikis to accelerate the process and get the many different experts that would need to cooperate to come together. Now, um, you know, there, there are some issues with doing that but I sort of have a bias in that direction. Great. Okay. So on that note, to what extent do you think successful open source software projects and collaborative efforts like Wikipedia, do, they, do you think they provide a good or bad model for this project? Um, I'm attracted to using this approach, but I think there's a couple qualifications that need to be made. Um, if you look at most open source software projects, um, I've aware of and studied a number of them in video compression, for example. In video compression, the project is actually implementing a detailed standard which has been established by ISO, which is sort of part of the United Nations. So it's specced out. The specification exists for what's going to be implemented at great detail in that case. And so it's possible to organize people uh, fairly effectively because you have the specification that you have to implement to actually have an open source you know, MPEG encoder or something like that. Um, this project is not at all like that. We're trying to develop that specification. We're trying to develop that sort of thing. Uh, we really would be doing basic research, which is different from implementing something we already know how to do. Um, not just video compression, but things like Linux or the GNU system. An awful lot of this work has been you know, doing something that has been figured out. You know, Unix had been done by at and It was already a working system, so it's like, let's create a free version of that. Um, uh, same with a lot of other projects. Um, there's a number of things that come out of the Free Software Foundation and they're, let's do a free version of Photoshop or let's do a free version of Microsoft Word. Well, the research, all this stuff that, you know, people like us deal with has already been done. And you have if you have a document or you have, we know what the product looks like, we're trying to duplicate its functionality, maybe even duplicate it pretty closely. So it doesn't, it isn't the same as doing a research project or this kind of conceptual design or some of these problems. It's, it's actually, there's a structure there that's been provided by other things. Uh, Wikipedia has a similar kind of thing. It's basically, let's do the Encyclopedia Britannica online for free. Let's take facts we already know and put them in there. It doesn't present itself as a research project at all. It's just, let's collect this data. Um, there aren't too many examples of sort of open source distributed internet research. Um, I don't think the archive server that's used in physics and, and quantitative biology, for example, it's mostly people posting preprints. You used to send them out by mail. Uh, now you post them, it's a little easier, so you get preprints you wouldn't have gotten before, you know, my opinions about physics or something like that. Um, but again, it's not really this kind of collaborative working environment. Um, I believe that the mathematician Timothy Gowers did an experiment where he had his blog and he put up this unsolved, I, I don't know how prominent it was, but it was an unsolved problem in mathematics. He sort of sent out to all the other people in the math community and said, let's sort of pool our resources and and prove this theorem or whatever they did. And they had apparently a success with doing that with just a lot of people posting different pieces of the problem to the blog. But there's not a lot of experience doing that. And my sense is that if you're doing research, which has, particularly what I'm talking about is very free form. It's, it's not like measuring something to another decimal place where we have a very well-defined structure for the experiments and what we want to do. Um, we are talking about trying to figure out an architecture, a design that would work in the real world for this bathtub mechanism, for example. 
And so, yes, I think we could use something along the lines of Wikipedia or the wikis where you're sharing data and ideas, but there's some unknowns in getting that to work with real people and real situations. I can't give an exact answer because I don't think we have a really good model for what you would do doing that. So I think people need to be aware that we can't just take what's been done with these programming projects or Wikipedia and just follow that. That's not what this would be. There would have to be some other mechanisms to handle some of the specifically research issues that are going to arise in trying to get something like this to work. So what sort of attitude or philosophy should participants in a multidisciplinary research project of this type have in order for it to succeed? Um, I think that the most important thing is to be, um, well, there, there's two things. I, I, I'm a physicist, and physicists are notorious for kind of a high-handed attitude towards other, you know, types of scientists. You know, we're the real, the real deal, and these other people are stamp collectors. I've heard that kind of thing. It's important to get it to succeed for people to recognize the expertise of the people they're working with. It's important for people, you're going to have to contribute in areas that you don't know so much about. Like, I don't know so much about biology. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to be wrong. And the other people are going to be doing the same things. So you have to be cognizant of that. You have to respect their expertise. You also have to respect that they're getting into some area and you are getting into some area that you're not so familiar with and there's going to be unavoidable mistakes and problems because of that. So you need to kind of, you know, uh, you need to be confident of your own expertise but you need to respect the other people and if you don't have that, it's, it's, it's not going to work. You have to have that kind of attitude. Great. So what are, what are the next steps? What can listeners do to help you and how can listeners contact you, Dr. McGowan? Um, I'm interested in simply feedback on the idea as it's currently expressed. Um, I've gotten some and there have been some you know, significant criticisms and so forth and that's important. Um, what really helps is for somebody to look at it and say that would work, here's how you do it, or no, there's no way that can work, that's why that, here's why that's not going to work, but you know, maybe I can show you a way that would work. Um, that kind of constructive criticism is absolutely essential to get it to work and to make a fair assessment of whether it could work at all. So that's the most valuable thing I think people could do right now. Um, they can do that by posting, my article is on the math blog right now, and you can post comments there or you can email me directly at jmcgowan11 at earthlink.net and the contact is on my, in my article. So those are things that people can do right now. I think going forward I maybe would, if it looks more promising, it might be good to discuss more extensive things, more formal things that we might be able to do. Excellent. So thank you again so much today, Dr. McGowan, for your time. I really appreciate it so much, and I'm sure we'd love to hear from you again in the future. Uh, we look forward to speaking to you again, and thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I really enjoyed the uh, interview.